plug? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Is it on? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's on. No, it's on. Oh, it's supposed to be on. Wait a second. No, it's working. Okay, so let's get started. So we're running a couple of minutes late. This is our next 90-minute session focused on uh, web security. So the first um, speaker today is Frank. So the, co uh, the topic of the presentation is on measuring and analysis of private key sharing in the HTTPS ecosystem. Let's go. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So as I said, I'm Frank, and this is a joint work with my collaborators at Duke Northeastern and University of Maryland. Uh, so today, I want to talk to you guys about key management in the PKI. So let's begin um, by considering a simple example here. Today, when you use your browser to visit a sensitive website like Bank of America, um, you typically accept to expect to see this green lock icon in your URL bar that indicates, number one, that your connection is secure um, and that no one can eavesdrop, uh, but perhaps more importantly, that it's authenticated uh, so that we can be sure we really are talking to the bank. So how does the website achieve this? Well, ahead of time, they're going to go ahead and generate a, a public-private key pair, and then go to any one of a set of widely trusted certificate authorities, uh, and they'll provide them with their public key. And after the certificate authority verifies their identity, then uh, in return, they'll provide a signed certificate which binds the website's identity to its public key. So now, when your browser accesses the website, um, they'll provide a copy of their certificate, and then they're going to participate in a TLS handshake. <clears throat> and if the handshake succeeds, then your browser knows that whoever they're connected to must have the private key. Uh, but in order for ownership of this key to translate to authentication, the fundamental assumption here is that the, only the website knows the private key. But as it turns out on the web today, uh, this scenario as I described it is actually quite rare. So as the internet's grown, because of the principles of economies of scale, among other reasons, uh, it's become much more cost effective for all kinds of websites to rent their infrastructure from third party hosting providers rather than to build and maintain it themselves. And of course, the whole point here is that uh, these providers are not just hosting one website, but many of them. And when I say uh, third parties here, what I really mean is a couple different types of services. So it includes content delivery networks like Akamai, web hosting providers like GoDaddy, uh, cloud providers like Amazon EC2. Uh, and they're going to have varying levels of involvement. So um, content delivery networks and web hosting services are going to be expected to actively serve the content, while cloud providers are just going to be passively um, providing access to virtual machines. But at the end of the day, the point is that all of them are being trusted to deliver content to the end user. So if we take a step back and look at the big picture here again, what happens in practice is uh, a DNS query for bankofamerica.com, for example, is going to resolve to one of the hosting provider servers, um, as opposed to one of Bank of America's servers. And so your browser is going to make a connection to this hosting provider, who then provides the certificate, and who also participates in the TLS handshake. And as before, the only way for this handshake to succeed is with the private key. So this implicitly means that the hosting provider must have access to it. And again, this applies not just to one single website, but to all of their customers. So this is the state of the web today. Third-party hosting providers know their customers' private keys. And this breaks that fundamental assumption that we made earlier. Um, and, and so conceptually, this is what hap what's happening today. But if you're skeptical and you want to see this for yourself, here's a, a quick example. Um, so just this morning, I went to Chick-fil-A.com, which is a, a website for a popular fast food chain in the US and just took a screenshot of the certificate being served to my browser. So in addition to Chick-fil-A here, you can see that there's a couple other domains included in the certificate. For instance, we see uh, towards the bottom, the Secretary of State uh, from Vermont. Uh, we see an Israeli bank uh, and even a large uh, Saudi Arabian ISP. So you can go and check this out yourself right now. And the thing is that all of these are on the same certificate, so they're all sharing the same private key. Uh, and so one of two things could be happening. Either all of them have the private key, uh, which would mean that they could all impersonate one another, so this is uh, unlikely, or just one of them has the private key. 
Uh, and in this case, that's the hosting provider, which you can see in the common name here, uh, Encapsula. So when there's many different organizations on the same certificate like this, we refer to this as a cruise liner certificate. Uh, and this is just one example of uh, many different ways that keys are shared today. But a natural question to ask at this point is, you know, so what? Uh, what's the big deal? What's wrong with sharing? Well, first of all, it complicates uh, the trust model of the PKI. The model doesn't really take hosting providers into account. Uh, and so there's this huge lack of transparency here. Users don't know who they're really communicating with, uh, and thus they don't really know who they're trusting. The second thing is that, again, going back to this principle of economies of scale, because these third parties are getting access to the keys for all their customers, this has the potential to, uh, first of all, centralize trust, but also to create uh, a single point of failure, failure in that the mistakes uh, by the hosting provider, uh, or sorry, the mistakes of one hosting provider could harm the security of all their customers at once. Um, so prior work has established that this behavior is occurring, uh, but not to what extent. So in this study, we wanted to shed light on key sharing across the internet. Namely, we wanted to be able to answer, uh, answer fundamental questions like, how many websites across the internet share their private keys? As a result of this, how many keys have these third parties obtained? And then finally, how does this behavior impact key management? And what I mean by key management here is who is ultimately responsible for revoking and reissuing the certificate. So now that hosting providers in the mix, uh, are in the mix, is it going to be their responsibility or the websites themselves? So in order to answer these questions at scale, uh, our first order of business was to obtain as many certificates as possible. So the folks at Rapid7 run weekly port 443 scans across the entire IPv4 address space. So we collected all of the scans available uh, from when they started in 2013 to when we uh, worked on the study in 2015. Uh, and the way these scans work is, for each IP address, they attempt to do uh, a TLS handshake. <clears throat> and then uh, if the handshake succeeds, then they record uh, the certificate they received and the IP address they contacted to get it. So, at the end of the day, this data set gave us uh, 5.1 million valid LEAF certificates, and then a mapping of each certificate to all of the IP addresses that we observed hosting it. So how can we use this to detect sharing? Well, it turns out this is actually a really challenging problem. Um, we devote a lot of effort to both creating a method methodology to solve this uh, and evaluating it in the paper, but I want to focus on the results in this talk. So I'm just going to give you the high-level overview uh, and hopefully convince you that this is actually a non-trivial problem. Uh, so if you start out with this, this example we have here, uh, two certificates uh, we observed hosting, uh, being hosted on two different hosts or IP addresses. Each certificate lists uh, either one or more domain names on them. Uh, and so even though this isn't part of our methodology exactly, it can be helpful to visualize this situation as a graph, where an edge between a domain and a hosting provider uh, represents the fact that uh, a domain appears on a certificate served by this hosting provider or sorry, by this IP address. So uh, remember, our goal here is to detect sharing. So what does that look like in this scenario? Well, it simply means that the entity that owns the domain, the orange boxes here, is not the same as the entity that owns and operates the server at the blue IP address boxes here. So how do we tell if a given domain and IP address represent the same organization? Well, a first thought might to just be to do a reverse DNS lookup on the IP addresses so that we can get everything in terms of domains. Uh, but as it turns out, this doesn't always work exactly right. So for 30% of the IP addresses uh, in our entire data set, it essentially returned null. Uh, so we actually deal with this case in the paper as well, uh, so you can check that out for more details. But for now, I just want to focus on the 70% that did return an IP address because even in this case, uh, it may not return consistent domain names for the same organization. Um, so let me give you a couple examples of this. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is look at two domains here, one at a time, and just think about this idea of domain equivalence. Do these two, two domains represent the same organizational, organizational entity? So if you look uh, in the first case, google.com versus google.co.uk, uh, it seems pretty easy. Most of us are going to recognize that these are just different uh, TLDs for Google. Uh, and this might initially lead you to think that some simple heuristics based on string matching uh, are going to get the job done. But uh, if you look at the next example, uh, whitehouse.com and whitehouse.gov, for example, uh, if you strip the TLD, the string is the same, 
but just trust me that these are not actually the same website. So on the other hand, um, sometimes the string is totally different, like google.com and youtube.com, for example. Um, but most of us intuitively know that YouTube is owned by Google. Um, but this information isn't represented in the domain names anywhere. And then uh, a further example is nestle.com and friskies.com at the bottom here. It turns out that Friskies uh, is a company owned by Nestle, but just looking at these domain names, you'd have no way of knowing that. Uh, and actually, Nestle is a really interesting case in that they have hundreds of domains, one uh, for every promotion and product they have. So uh, it's, it's a really tough problem to match these because they all have completely different strings that are not at all related to Nestle. And so the, the bottom line here is that domain names are not enough. If we want to do this comparison, we need additional information. Uh, and so in particular, what, what we did this time was uh, to use whois information, uh, and in particular, the email address fields in, in the whois records. And we used this to infer uh, the administrative relationships <coughs> um, between domains. So just to go through one uh, really simple example of this, a whois lookup for google.com returned uh, these three email addresses. And then, perhaps as expected, uh, a lookup for other Google TLDs returns, um, sorry, returns the same email addresses. And so we can conceptually uh, link these together as having the same whois email address. But then if we look at the email addresses for zagat.com and golang.org, for example, uh, we find that they too have the exact same email addresses. And as it turns out, Zagat and, uh, Golang and the Go language are, of course, both owned by Google. So this technique has essentially allowed us to identify this administrative relationship, uh, even though it's not represented in the domain name anywhere. <clears throat> and so again, we can link these together. And uh, these all represent conceptually the same domain organization. Now I just want to reinforce that this is a really simplified example. We went through, uh, we did a lot of work to handle a bunch of different cases uh, in our methodology. So I encourage you to, to look uh, at the paper for that. But this is just gives you a kind of a flavor for what, what this problem is like. So uh, now if you consider that we have this me methodology, uh, if we go back to our situation from before, we could first apply it to collapse the domain names here into domain organizations. And then after acquiring a, a domain name for the IP addresses, we can also apply a similar methodology to the hosting providers, collapsing those IP addresses into host organizations. And now, uh, if at this point you remember the whole reason we're here is we want to detect key sharing. And at this point, it's, it's actually pretty easy. So we can simply compare the organization of the domain on a certificate uh, with the organization of the IP address hosting that certificate. And if they're the same, then the website is being self-hosted. Uh, and if they're not, then the private key is being shared. And so with that, we can try to tackle those big questions that I posed earlier. So first of all, how prevalent is key sharing? Suppose the uh, organizations we saw looked something like this. If we were to go through each edge here uh, and label it blue if the domain and host uh, matched were the same, uh, meaning that they were self-hosted, and yellow if they were not, meaning that key sharing is occurring, then what we're really asking here is what's the degree of the yellow edges at each domain organization? So here I'm going to plot uh, a distribution of exactly that, the number of hosting providers used by each domain organization. And if you take a look here, what you can see is that 23.5% of all organizations didn't use any third-party hosting providers. So this means they, they hosted their websites themselves. But the vast majority, 76.5%, used at least one third party. And some even used tens or thousands of them. So clearly, a lot of organizations are sharing here. But a logical question to ask would be, who is sharing? Is it the sensitive websites that we care about, like banks or social media accounts? Or is it just going to be smaller websites? So to uh, gain some insight into this, we looked at this distribution now in terms of website popularity across the Alexa top 1 million domains. And what this plot shows is that for each group of 10,000 domains, what fraction of those in the bin used at least one third party to host their certificates? So if we look at the very most popular websites here, the Alexa Top 10,000, we can see that 43.2% of them shared at least one of their private keys. But it's not only them, right? If we look at the rest of this plot, um, there's some noise, but the fraction of each group that's sharing with third parties is almost always in the range of uh, 40 to 50% here. 
The point being, this behavior isn't isolated to any one group, uh, but it's actually common across websites of varying popularity. And if you look at the second, the red line down here at the bottom, uh, we also plotted the fraction of what fraction of each group shared all of their keys. And while this behavior is much less common across the board, uh, interestingly, it's actually especially popular among the Alexa Top 10,000, uh, which shared 22.4%. 22.4% of them shared all of their keys. So <clears throat> key sharing is common across the internet. Uh, and clearly a lot of these keys are being shared, but, but this begs the question, how many keys have these third-party hosting providers aggregated? So going back to, to this example, if we want to know how many unique customers each host is serving, we can simply look at uh, the degree of the yellow edges on the host organization side this time. <clears throat> so what I've plotted here is uh, the number of unique customers of each third-party hosting provider ranked by the number of customers. So uh, the most popular hosting provider in our data set here, sorry, the most popular hosting provider in our data set here, uh, secureserver.net, has the keys for over 266,000 distinct customers. And there's a bunch of other familiar hosting providers in this top list here that we can see serving thousands and thousands of certificates. Um, but if we look at the broad scheme of things, notice that the x-axis in the bottom here is a log scale. So even though we observed roughly 30,000 total hosting providers, uh, just the top 1% of those served the keys for 86% of all the organizations we observed. So not only are a lot of keys being aggregated at the hosting providers, but they're being aggregated in a very small subset of them. To view this another way, let's consider what this situation looks like from an attacker's perspective. So just suppose hypothetically with me for a minute that we had an all-powerful and an all-knowing attacker that could compromise any organization he desired. Well, one thing he could do is uh, attack an individual organization, which might be a particular bank, for example, but he could also instead attack the bank's host organization. And this, in doing so, at the same time, would give him access to all of the keys that the hosting provider was holding onto. So if you expand this idea, uh, the plot here shows that by compromising X hosting organizations, what fraction of all the private keys, Y, would an attacker be able to acquire? So let's just start by considering the Alexa top 1,000 domains. What this plot shows is that uh, by compromising just a single provider, an attacker could gain access to 60% of the top 1,000 private keys. And the way this works is that each step in the plot represents the hosting provider that has access to the greatest number of keys the attacker hasn't acquired yet. So if we uh, look at all domains now, you can see that, again, for example, um, an attacker, <clears throat> by, by attacking just 10 hosting providers, an attacker could gain access to greater than 40% of uh, all the site's public keys. So the other thing to notice here is just how quickly these uh, lines taper off. So after compromising just a few hosting providers, each additional hosting provider is only adding a few more unique keys for the attacker. So the majority of keys really are concentrated uh, in the first few providers. And ultimately what this means is that they become really uh, prime targets for attack. So the final aspect of key sharing that we wanted to understand here was management. And again, what I mean by management is, um, well, so whoever's managing the certificate is uh, someone who has a couple responsibilities. First of all, they're going to be the ones that are requesting the certificate. Second of all, they're going to have to renew the certificates when they expire. And then perhaps most importantly, um, they're going to be responsible for handling compromised certificates. And this is particularly important because if it's not done, then after a compromise, an attacker could continue to impersonate a victim. So uh, in the context of key sharing, though, it's not clear who has these responsibilities. Is it, again, the hosting providers or the websites themselves? So uh, to see how we, we answer that, consider two very different types of providers here. On the left side, we have Amazon Web Services, uh, in which case websites acquire their certificates independently, and then they upload them to the server, uh, their virtual machine, for example. And so what we'd expect here is that the set of issuing uh, 
certificate authorities would be diverse. Uh, but alternatively, if you look at the other side where we have Cloudflare, um, oftentimes an organization like this acquires certificates on behalf of their customers. Uh, and so these organizations also tend to have a business relationship with one particular certificate authority uh, that they go to more regularly. And so we'd expect the distribution of issuing CAs to be very skewed uh, heavily towards that one CA. <clears throat> so if we take a step back here, how do we determine who's managing the private keys? Well, if we see a diverse set of signing authorities, then we say that the websites must be managing the keys themselves. And if it's a very skewed set uh, of issuing CAs, <clears throat> then we say that the hosting provider must be managing the keys. And if you're wondering, like, just how common is this behavior, well, 58.4% of the Alexa Top 10,000 uh, exhibited this behavior, and 33% of all certificates. So not only is it common, you know, across the board again, but it's even more common in the most popular websites. And this is just the intu uh, intuition. A in the paper, again, we went into more detail about this methodology and validated our approach with um, a bunch of specific providers. But uh, this just gives you kind of a sense for, for how this works. So <clears throat> now we'd like to see how do these two compare? Uh, namely, which one leads to better management uh, practices? So there's a bunch of different ways you could evaluate this, uh, and we'll address a few of them in the paper. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, I just want to focus on one example, which is uh, using the Heartbleed bug as a natural experiment to see how the hosting services reacted. So when it was released in April 2014, everyone should have revoked and reissued. Uh, but this is a little bit different than what we found in practice. So in this plot, uh, <clears throat> we start with the Heartbleed bug occurring all the way on the left here. And then we looked at, for each day over the following month, what fraction of vulnerable certificates were still not revoked on that date? And we compared this for the outsourced and the self-managed certificates. So ideally, we would see uh, a line at x equals zero here, meaning that everyone revoked immediately. But uh, clearly, th that's not at all what we see. Uh, and so really, as a whole, everyone is doing pretty poorly. Uh, if you notice uh, the y-axis here, it begins at uh, 0.75 all the way at the bottom. And so at best, uh, we're talking about 75% of certificates not yet revoked at the end of a whole month after the bug was released. <clears throat> so initially, it seems like the hosting providers are at least doing a better job here. But as it turns out, this huge drop about, this huge drop about 10 days in is actually uh, primarily made up of Cloudflare revocations. So if we were to plot this same line for the outsourced uh, certificates, not including Cloudflare, you can see that, that the distribution looks uh, much more similar now. Admittedly, the hosting providers are still slightly more thorough, but uh, at the end of the day, it's really the, the same story. Uh, and the other thing that's really important to note here is that even though we had this huge drop thanks to Cloudflare, it didn't occur until 10 full days after the bug was released. So this is a bit late. Uh, and so there's a few big players that at least responded thoroughly here. Um, but the majority of them did not. And uh, some even did worse. So to illustrate that, uh, what we did is expanded the, the time range here out to one full year after Heartbleed. And we looked at what fraction of vulnerable certificates uh, each hosting provider had revoked by this point. Now ideally, we would see a, line, a vertical line this time at x equals 1, which means that uh, all hosting providers revoked all of their certificates. But rather surprisingly, we find that even one year after Heartbleed occurred, a majority, 66% of all the hosting providers we observed uh, that were managing the certificates for their customers did not revoke a single certificate. And in the tail at the, the top right of the plot here, we can see that uh, a small minority of third-party providers revoked most of the certificates, but none of them revoked all of them. So the answer to our final question is a bit unclear. A very small number of hosting providers seem to be managing keys responsibly, but the vast majority of them are not. So since this responsibility of managing keys is aggregated in the hands of uh, the administrators at the hosting providers, it creates this single point of fail failure. One hosting provider's uh, mistake of not revoking or reissuing properly hurts the security for a potentially large number of websites. So to summarize, Due to economic incentives, uh, third-party hosting, and thus key sharing, is prevalent in today's web, with 76.5% of all organizations sharing at least one key with a hosting provider. <clears throat>
Now, this has resulted in a large number of keys being aggregated at a very small set of hosting providers. And some of them are managing the keys responsibly, but the majority of them are not. So the big takeaway here is that hosting providers don't currently fit into our model of the PKI. <clears throat> and so future work on the PKI should uh, take these hosting providers and more generally economics into account in order to develop new protocols that don't rely on key sharing for security. So um, all of the code and data that we used uh, and all of the methodology that we developed uh, is going to be available at securepki.org. So if you guys are interested, I encourage you uh, to check that out. Thanks.